Hello there. Hello there. So we have Sylvie Chogassian. Got I, it. Did I do it? You did. Chogassian. I'm going to do it one more time. I love it. Yeah. And then uh, I was looking at your, uh, your Facebook page and I was uh, uh, reading a little bit about your, uh, I was curious about the, the credential you had. Now, mm. now, uh, now you had a AMFT. What is that exactly? It's so that a, means I'm an associate marriage and family therapist that okay. I've, I've been doing therapy for about five years and I'm a few years, a few years, a few months away from being fully licensed, but I've been, I've been also doing relationship coaching and all that juicy stuff for about seven years. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. Great, great, great. So you've gotten your hour. So you've got your hours and you're about to study for the test. Yes. I have over 3000 hours. I'm just at the final, final breakthrough point. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, 3,000 hours, you made it through. I made it through. Never and, thought the day would come. Yeah. And did you have some really good supervisors helping with that? I did. You know, I had a really uh, large range of experience. I've worked from everywhere from preschool settings with, with little kids in the classroom with their parents. Mm -hmm. I worked in a group home setting in the teenage years. Mm -hmm. And then I worked with couples and individuals in my private practice supervision. So it is all very different, and I, I love the couple's work. That is for sure my love. You like that the most? That's my favorite, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've uh, lately been, uh, uh, you know, continuously blown away by how much the argument is the same mm. that every couple has. Mm. Um, and it's... Uh, uh, it, it's a continuous challenge to have two people, whether they've been dating for, uh, you know, a month or they've been, you know, 25 years in a marriage. Mm. It's, it's continually amazing to me that they have uh, no idea what the other person needs. Mm. They have no idea. And uh, it comes down to this thing that I constantly help couples do and 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 I want to break this apart for just a few more seconds here and then yeah. I want to see I want to see I want to see another opinion I want to hear another opinion uh, sure. the I literally use my hands when I'm working with a couple okay. and I tell them sometimes I want you to separate this into two different things there's your story about what you're hurting about and your story about what you think they're hurting about. And I want you to make those two entirely different things, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what you believe they, they think is really happening. That's yet another thing, okay? These are all separate things, and I want you to think about this like they're not even related. Mm -hmm. Like they have nothing to do with each other, not a thing. And in doing that, I then will often, you know, when, when they're scratching their head and they're saying, well, how do I do that? Because I really am mad at her. I really am pissed off at him. You know, how do I do what you're saying? And, and then I'll say something like, I want you to pretend you're interviewing this person like you've just met them for the first time. And the story has nothing to do with you. You're just going to listen to them tell their story and all your issues of guilt or thinking that you're being blamed. All of that goes out the window because you just met this person for the first time at a, at a cafe and you're going to sit and talk about it. Right? So while I'm all about the, the emotional aspect of what's really going on deeply and I don't want to teach too much, I am finding that for some couples, I have to almost trick them a little bit into seeing it a little bit of a different way and, and use the mind uh, to help, you, help them use their mind to really change thinking that they're the cause of the problem and just hearing this person like they've just met them. So when I say all that, that long-winded thing, which is usually more long-winded when I have people sitting in front of me, 
Um, how do you react to that? And I'm not looking for a, a, an exact answer, or right or wrong, but how, how do you react to that? I love it, first of all. Um, and what, why I love it is because for me, when I hear you say that and break it down in that way, um, what it does for couples is it externalizes the problem. You know, it almost yeah. it takes the problem outside of both of themselves. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm all about the attachment theory and how all of our problems were there before the couple and they just keep repeating themselves. And so what you're saying is a way of almost, yes, feel the feelings, experience, you know, you're upset with your partner and whatever it is that you have to feel, but is there any way you can also make space there to detach a little bit and to see them as a separate person, which is so hard to do when we're that bonded with someone? Yeah. Yeah. It really, it really is hard to do. Um, when, when I'm getting people set up with that idea that I just said, mm -hmm. it is not something that I just say and then move on uh, throughout the rest of the session, trying to have other concepts. Mm -hmm. So, once, once they feel safe, couples usually feel safe with me or, or individuals in the first session. Sometimes I'll wait till the second session to start doing this with people. Mm. And I actually am now assuming they don't get what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, and what I mean, they, you know, there are, everybody's smart that comes in here, but I'm assuming they uh, have a hard time integrating what I'm saying into their experience and really mm. knowing what to do with it. So then I, then I start, and I, once again, I want to get your, your feedback on this. I actually, uh, uh, I actually help create this container and it's not just like a container of safety. It's something different from that. It's a container where I can soon use the language of telling them, Oh, you're out of context. Hmm. Right. You, you, oh, you've gone outside of the rules mm. of what we're talking about. <clears throat> and I'm really gentle about that at first. I, I continuously reassure people that uh, uh, it's okay because you know what happens very quickly. They want to impress me. Mm. They, they, they want that, you know, and you know, when I first started doing this, clients would literally say, oh, I messed up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right. So, so I'm actually doing it so much more gently now that that's not happening, but going out of context means I'm react like, like it, let's say I was listening to you tell me something you're upset about mm. and I'm supposed to be the listener, right? Yeah. Well, if I say, if I say something that is in the most subtle way about me, that's what I continuously come back to helping them see. Right. Yeah. Right. I, Oh, that's, Oh, that's out of context. Well, what do you mean that's out of context? Well, you're now talking about you and your frustration about it. Mm -hmm. You're not listening to the other person's pain as if they were a stranger. Right. Yeah. So you're out of context. Out of, so does that, does that ring a bell for any way you do it or does that make sense? Well, I think our work is very similar and, you know, I've been a huge fan of yours and so supportive of your work for so long. And the reason why I resonate is because there's such a, a compassionate yet contained way that you do your work. And so um, what I'm hearing is that it's almost like you're playing a role of that boundary. You're holding those boundaries mm -hmm. for the clients. And um I do it differently, but I think the message is the same is, you know, the therapist, I play the, the, I'm the bridge between both people. So when either one of the partners is not able to regulate their own feelings, they act out, you know, and that happens differently for each person, whether it's to be, to be critical of their partner or to shame them, that's them being dysregulated. And so if I'm not there mirroring, okay, hey, 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 you know, there's something happening for you. Let's look at that. They'll just keep going forever and ever and ever and never really get to the root of what's happening. So it's like that pause and slowing down and really mirroring. And, um, mm -hmm. and then when a parent doesn't do a good job of um, really giving their children boundaries, you know, we, we suck at them as adults because we yeah. don't know how to give them into ourselves. And so it's like, you're doing that, you're modeling that for, for your clients. When, yeah. when you say that to me, that's what I hear. Yeah. 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 And the, 
you know, with the out of context concept, uh, the, the reason I'm starting to like that more and more is that <clears throat> the couple um, or even the individual, you know, this is similar for an individual who's working through their frustration with someone they're just, they're dating. That's brand mm -hmm. new. It's actually, <clears throat> it's actually the same exact issue. It's mm -hmm. just in its infancy when you start dating. And the issue is uh, uh, how to know that you are responding to an argument mm -hmm. the same way you've been doing it your whole life. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is fascinating. Like, so what does a couple do? You know, they come in here and, and, and their eyes are all blood, you know, bloodshot and they say, oh, we were up all night fighting. You know, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a, sometimes a 14 hour fight. Mm -hmm. And I've recently seen this with uh, some of the women I've been coaching uh, where they've been in 14 hour fights. Yes, yes. I'm not laughing at them. I'm not laughing at a silliness right now. I'm actually yeah. laughing out of how, how, how painful it is. It's yeah. like you, it's like a 14 hour fight with someone they've been dating for 45 days, mm. which means the fight is literally between me and me. Right. Right. The fight has nothing to do with the other person. It has a little to do with the other person, but, but pretty much nothing. And, and that has to do with me not having any idea how to meet my needs, mm. right? H how to say, ouch, you stepped on my foot and have the other partner say, I'm sorry, tell me more about how much that hurts. Mm. They sometimes weren't able to do that even, even when they first met, even when couples are in love, mm. you know, they, 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 they don't know how to do that. So, I sometimes feel like that's, that's the actual deepest coaching to show somebody you've been doing this your whole life. You know, how's that working to actually get another person to hear you? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, so how are you resonating with this? Sylvie? How, how are you hearing this in terms of they like, like the couple that's in an argument, they, cannot hear each other and you, you got to interrupt that you have to proactively interrupt that so how, how do you approach that or do you agree with me that that's what's happening i mean i always agree that our feelings are always about us you know no matter what who we end up in a relationship with we yeah. end up you know provoking certain things or speaking in certain ways to make them into our mother or make them into our father in order to um, and like you said, that can go on for 14 hours in a night, or it can go on for a 14 year relationship. But you know, the piece that I work a lot with, um, I work a lot with trauma. So there's usually one person in, in the relationship in the couple that has uh, a lot of trauma. And so that means that they have, if they've never really worked on that issue, they, um, that's been, they've been in flight or fight mode for as long as they can remember. And so they've been stuck. They don't even know what's happening inside of themselves. They haven't had the time to, you know, understand and question like a normal person would be able to have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what you're saying, it, it's almost like I'm acting out that trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to, to finally bring, I'm bringing out those, those feelings of helplessness or fear. Mm -hmm. But instead of, Saying that, I'm, I'm giving you my defense because I don't know how to be with what's underneath that, yeah. you know? And it's so, it's so hard to watch and it's so painful to watch, but, you know, what's possible on the other side. But getting people to even accept that, that that's, that's actually happening, it's like never about the actual fight. That's the piece that I think, you know, you have to be really a skillful, skillful coach or therapist to, to get them to believe you that there is a different possibility there. Yeah. That's yeah. hard. Yeah. 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 What's, um, what's so interesting is how much I recognize that what, what the couple has to learn ultimately is, is, is how to become counselors. Mm. Right. Don't they, isn't, isn't that the irony? Irony was well, yes. it an irony? Yeah. It's an irony of yeah. we're actually teaching them how to be like us, mm. uh, which is, how, how to listen, uh, some, I mean, you know, it's, it's more unconditional coming from a counselor or a therapist, but um, how to be unconditionally 
how to unconditionally listen to the other person mm -hmm. as if they're not even involved, you know, as a, as a starting point. Um, do, do you ever think about it that way? Like, wow, I'm, I'm really teaching them how to listen. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, the way that I can listen to my clients is a million times better than the way that I could listen to my own partner yeah. or my own friends. You know, it's, it's it's completely different, even though I bond and attach to my clients, no doubt about that. Yeah. But it is a certain modeling of Okay, I'm, look, I'm, watch, I'm listening to your partner, I'm listening to you, and they can kind of see the back and forth happening. Yeah. So it, it gives them a model. I mean, most of us, I mean, don't have a model for this kind of, you know, back and forth ability to co-regulate each other, you know, to manage each other's nervous systems, which is why, you know, so many of us, including myself, run away from one relationship to another relationship because we haven't we haven't been with someone that has been the counselor, like what you just said, to help us manage that part of us. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, every person needs to learn the skill of, you know, knowing your partner's sensitivities, understanding that they're real for them, their main two, there's usually main two or three ones, and mm -hmm. it is our job and it is our responsibility to know how to manage them. And most people don't, don't take that on and they think that they just, you know, they don't realize that that's a skill that's absolutely necessary to thrive. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're dealing with um, a, a, a person that's had a lot, a lot of trauma, like one person's had more trauma than the other. Mm. Uh, do you, do you experience where you finally get them hearing each other? They've finally listened, and uh, uh, you know the both. It seems like both of them get what happened, mm. and you know, you know, people are crying. Yeah, and either the next moment or the next session, some or somewhere in between, it's like it wasn't even learned at all. Mm. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. And then, that's a very difficult position because I mean I'm familiar with you know like the DSM and looking things up and trying to understand if we have you know a you know how I think of it a quote unquote mental illness right yeah, yeah. Um, that's a very difficult thing. Have you ever had to work with one side of a relationship, one of the partners? and say, um, we're dealing with a mental health problem where this need is not gonna get met. This is not going to work to have the kind of listening you're looking for. Have you had to do that? You mean from the person that has a trauma or the partner? Either. Well, the Either. person who has the trauma is the one that's, that would be a really confusing conversation, right? Yeah. And you're yeah. probably not the one diagnosing them individually. Yeah. Right, right. So, yeah, so, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more, what happens is when we do a couple of sessions with one partner that tends to have the trauma, the sessions really revolve around the person that has the trauma okay. and it's clarified from the beginning that the other person is, it's their, their, their presence alone, their ability to be compassionate is what is going to help the person that's been traumatized to really heal. Okay. But I work with the other partner, um, separately to help them kind of yeah. process their experience and really uh, normalize, you know, whatever, if, if, the, if, if they were triggered or how that's showing up, but it is really um, taking the traumatized person back to the sensory experience of what happened for them and having the other partner just hear them and, you know, turn to them and be present for them. Mm -hmm. But then, like you said, the next week, their shame is through the roof. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it feels like we're back in square one and they want to run away from the relationship. So yeah. they, you know, they come to me and then they, they just need to know that that's normal. And it takes, I mean, tra people that have trauma that stick to this work are probably the most courageous people that I've ever worked with. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So you see individuals that are single and want to have relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Definitely. So... so <clears throat> When, when they come to you and maybe, you know, maybe you've helped them get out of a relationship. You know, I, I help a lot of people get out of relationships mm. and 
they get out of the relationship. You know, I really, you know, I, I do all the stuff I write about when I do that. I, you know, you know, I make sure that they were really vulnerable. I make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm not siding with this other party or I'm not siding with my client. Yeah. And, and versus a stranger who it's unfair that I don't know them. I'm not doing that. I'm very skilled at that. But the person now takes a breather and wants to begin dating again. Mm. And they almost always ask me, how do I prepare myself mm. to be ready for the next relationship? And I, 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 I might say my answer after because it's a little, it, it, it's, a, it's in a little bit of a box mm. that I'm in with that because it's, it's, it's a little bit more my beliefs and uh, about what they really need to do. And I, I'm curious, have you had that question posed to you? Like, what can I do to prepare myself for the relationship? Maybe not framed exactly that way, but um, I wrote something a while ago about how we can have all the self-awareness skills in the world. You know, we can be aware and, you know, I can be alone and feel powerful and empowered and learn all these tools. But then learning relationship skills is a completely different skill set. It's yeah. completely different. You know, regulating myself is one thing, but learning how to do that dance between me and you yeah. is completely different. Yeah. And so I, I always just suggest either they're working with a therapist or a coach to help carry and, you know, really have that mutuality of the back and forth relationship. So a lot of those things can come up there. So mm -hmm. when they do meet someone, they feel more prepared just because of that relationship itself. Or if they have a friend in their life that they're really close with, like a, a really safe friend, I always tell them, you know, create a container for you guys where you can really start to express, how, you know, where you can tell them your boundaries, where you can tell them what your, what your fears are in a way that you're not judged. And you'd be shocked. Most people that, you know, don't have a relationship in an intimate way, they usually struggle with even friendship. So it's all across the board. So it's one person in your life, whether it's a therapist, whether it's a friend, whether it's a mentor, that you can start to, you know, take on um, caring about somebody else's feelings, just not just not just yours. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Um, and my, you know, my answer is not all that different. I mean, you know, one of the things I say is, okay. You know, you've been out of a relationship, you know, and, and it's been, you know, three weeks. I mean, unless it's, there's a real grieving period, what I pretty much say is uh, uh, now we need to get you back in a relationship, mm -hmm. except we need to do one thing at a time. And there are some really smart clients that I have that actually have taken me up on this and you know, they, they go on a date and then they call me mm. and they go on another date and then they call me because it, 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 you know, they have to use their own mind, which has gotten them into all these problems in the first place to be the one to come back to me and say, you know, well, this happened and this happened. What do you think? Mm. Right. So that's the thing that is so, uh, uh, seldom understood about this you know how do i read every book i don't even have books i recommend anymore on, really? on relationships wow. um I, uh, I mean i like some of the gottman stuff um i like the sue johnson books uh but what i tell them is you know yeah what i tell them is you know the phd program is getting in a relationship mm -hmm. and learning how to say uh that hurt my feelings i didn't like that that's mm -hmm. actually that actually eliminates 1200 pages that they need to read if they can do that yes so does that go along with kind of what you're thinking like to you know, enter relationship absolutely i mean the i'm working with someone now that was when we first started she was single and she was really ready for a relationship but scared you know very scared of repeating the same patterns mm -hmm. and she met a few people you know during the initial sessions and they were all fundamentally different. You know, one of them was clearly unhealthy, an unhealthy choice for her and just very much was emotionally unavailable. Mm -hmm. But because we had, you know, talked about it on a logical level 
and because she had the comparison. Like I always say, don't limit yourself to just, you know, one date, three months with them. And then you're, you, especially if you're someone that's not really a good dater, I always say you need a variety of people to really get perspective on what's even possible. You yeah. don't even know what you like sometimes because yeah. we, you know, we're drawn to what's familiar. And if we don't, you know, as we're adults, we, we go to work, we go home. We don't really have, unless we're very social, we're meeting the same kinds of people all the time. So we slow it down. You know, we, I teach her how to regulate when her own anxiety kicks in. I teach her how to, how to bring up what she's upset about, but also, you know, communicating that, that she's not blaming him, that it's about her. So it's, it's also, yeah. to me, so much of it is about the teaching of the vulnerable language. We think we're being vulnerable. I mean, I'm telling you as a therapist, <laughs> when I got in a relationship, I was like, I cannot even believe some of the things that would come out of my mouth and how much <laughs> shame there was there. Yeah. It's like, and on an unconscious level, we know. We know that we're avoiding a relationship because of what the enormous amount of things that's underneath the surface. Yeah. And so having the support of you or a coach or somebody, it just, it's like somebody's there with you. You're not doing it alone. You don't have to go through the confusion of it by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. People, um, some people get in relationships and they recognize um, it, does, it doesn't work and then they gracefully exit the relationship. Um, I, I, I've personally never met anyone who I think does what I just described well. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and then there's people like me, how I used to be years ago and, and people like most, I, I, have to, I could say most of my clients um, but you get into a relationship and I'm all about, you know, going slow, mm. telling people to go slow, not slow. Like there's a template for how quickly to have sex. I, I'm talking about slow for, for you to recognize, okay, you've fallen in love and your brain is now no longer functional mm. in terms of seeing what's really happening. Like denial gets put in place. Now the problem with this, with some, uh, you know, I'm going to say upwards of 25% of everyone I coach. The mm. problem is as soon as it's worse for women than men, but is in my practice, but as soon as a person crosses this certain line, usually physically, uh, and it can just be kissing, uh, they are locked in position of being in a relationship, whether anyone's talking about commitment or monogamy or a relationship that that has nothing to do with, with it. Mm. It's that they're locked into something that they don't necessarily want to be in. And they, their, their whole world changes in relation to this person. So an exercise I've been doing, <clears throat> which I'm going to ask for your, I'm going to ask for your opinion on because it's, it's pretty radical. And I wouldn't do it if I wasn't there to be really supportive. Mm. Uh, I've had uh, a couple men and now three women over the past eight, eight, eight or nine months uh, go to speed dating. Mm. And they have a task that is so difficult for them to do that we have a session scheduled after. Right after. Right after. They, they can call me during the speed dating or the mm -hmm. session is after because it's on the, it's on the magnitude of uh, one person like, like almost vomited. Wow. Okay. wow. And the task is the following. Uh, that, you know, I think you meet, for, I haven't, I, I went to one of those like 25 years ago. I, I you know, I, I, I think you meet for like seven or eight minutes with each person and you sit in some, you know, bar or restaurant and at the end of which, you make a little note of whether you want to meet that person or not. And then the ones that match up together, you get notified later if there's a match. Mm. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it's a safe way to do it, except I've added one component to it, which is they have to look in the eyes of the person they meet with for seven minutes and you know, shake their hand or, or, or whatever. And they have to tell them whether or not they, they marked them down as somebody they want to meet or the actual hard exercise is they have to tell them 
no, you know, they, they tell them, no, I won't be contacting you. This is our last time together. Wow. It is excruciating for the personality type that gets so hooked in just because they've committed to somebody for seven minutes. Mm. Okay. So the big concept here is I'm teaching people. I didn't know this would happen until this year. I'm, I'm teaching people to get, I want them to get in relationships and get out of relationships. Mm. I want them to know and have the experience of how to get in, how to say the truth and get out. Got it. And that, that's a real skill. That, that's a skill. I can't just have an appointment, you know, set up for the next Thursday at 3 p.m. That's a skill where, or that, that, that I need to be available for that. So what's your response? Wow. That's huge. <laughs> I mean, I can understand. I would definitely be on, on that. What was it? The 25% that probably throws up after? Yeah. Yeah, that's a rough ride. Oh, man. I mean, of course, I can imagine different people responding differently to that. But anyone that struggled with boundaries, really saying yeah. no, yeah, really, you know, claiming their power and really feeling like their, you know, that their, their no is just as valid as their yes, I can understand how that would be extremely hard. But yeah. with a stranger, of course, it's so much easier. And it's good to practice with someone that there's no, yeah. um, there's no, there's no attachment with. But even then, it's, it's, it's amazing how, you know, one of the things um, I was talking to my supervisor about today was just how, you know, in certain situations, we feel very powerless. And I think a lot of times, um, you know, I'm wondering if more of, of the people that struggle doing this in, in your practice are women. Uh, but whenever there's, you know, there's, there's always a power dynamic happening in the relationship. And whoever is um, the more, um, you know, who carries a little bit more of that authoritarian figure, it's really hard to have a voice in that. So I can see why you're like preparing them that when they do enter a relationship, mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a practice that would enable people to um, again, what, why, what stops us from doing that and helps yeah. them regulate those feelings? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it creates, um, it's, it's unbelievable shame yeah. that the person goes through having to say no to the person in front of them. And I'll, and I'll tell you, I have the statistics now a little bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, when you do this, um, you, you actually, uh, will deeply, hurt the feelings of the person you're telling I won't be calling you again. Mm. Um, so, so what I realized on this last session I did with somebody is, you know, I'm actually pushing those people into uh, uh, their, so their social anxiety issues have to also be looked at. Um, they're actually offending another person and that person has responded back. No one's gotten slugged or anything but they actually have people saying back to them, well, you're not so hot yourself, you know? Mm. So you're, you're bringing up the, you know, the kind of meanness in people. I think it's a hugely valuable exercise. And by the way, I wouldn't, I would not ever do this with somebody who wasn't prepared for it. Yeah. Um, you know, when I, you know, when I, you know, I really, really know these clients that are ready yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, so and that's obviously now with a trauma, a trauma victim, of course. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Let's re-traumatize yeah, you yeah, again. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't believe I've hurt anyone with this exercise, except for the people, you, you know, I wish I could have them say no to the other person and then hand that person my card <laughs> so, I could, yeah. so I could help that person who feels so rejected, yeah. you know, but anyway, that's, I'm kidding around. That's not my responsibility. Um, well, there's so much about the, you know, the talk of boundaries nowadays in, in our therapy and coaching culture. And, you know, what happens is when we first even identify a boundary and saying no is a boundary. It's, it's saying that I'm, you know, I'm creating this, I'm keeping myself in integrity by saying no and not moving forward. And I'm doing it in a way that's truthful. I'm not, you know, ghosting you, even though it's just, you know, it's speed dating, yeah. but it, it allows people to get more comfortable with setting boundaries because I think, yeah. you know, for anybody that I've ever worked with, including myself, when I first started saying boundary, they came off really harshly because there's so much energy behind it. It's like, no, you know, get away from me. It's so yeah. hard because you think that you're being, we're being vulnerable, but then someone's going to, you know, come and take that no back away. 
-hmm. So it's like, how can we find our own version of no that feels like, okay, I can, I, I can do this and still be loving and kind and compassionate, yeah. you know, whereas a lot of times if someone I'm working with dated someone and, you know, there's so much of a ghosting culture, they don't even, you know, text them back if they, if they reach out and it's like, no, send them, you can send them a message, you know, I had a great time, but I'm, I just don't feel a connection. It's like, you can still do it in a very kind and loving way. And then it's the other person's going to, of course, deal with their own rejection and deal with whatever it is. But at least, you know, I feel like finding our own version of boundaries that feel honorable is, is really a big part of the work. Yeah, it really is. It really is. <clears throat> I recently in the last, uh, uh, six months had to tell somebody in this social place that I spend time at and near my house. Uh, uh, it's like a, uh, like a, uh, a market cafe type place. And I, mm -hmm. it's the first time in my life ever that I had to tell somebody, uh, uh, you, you, our relationship is over and you can't ever approach me or talk to me again. Mm. Wow. I've, I've never had wow. to do that before. And this is a person that I probably see once a week. Mm. You know, probably once a week I am in the presence of in this social setting. And <clears throat> while I can say I'm, I'm proud of myself, it's been empowering mm. to do this exercise. Uh, the, the, the truth is because I was not valued in my childhood mm. and, and, and the way my shame got set up, um, I, I feel like the bad person i mm -hmm. feel like 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 i don't feel like i'm like intellectually i don't feel like i'm doing anything wrong mm. but it's such a new neural pathway to know that i've done that that i'm actually it, it's interesting i i'm fighting with like um self-righteousness or something mm. it's hard to describe but like when i when i go there and i see this person and i walk around him it's not I, like I'm pretty, I'm pretty mellow about most things, but it's an actual experience probably of shame in me because I don't deserve to have that boundary set. Mm. Right. And this person is going a little bit crazy and figure because, because he's a, it's a man and he's a mess mm. and he's going a little crazy trying to figure out how to process this. Yeah. And I'm not making that my problem at all. So, so here, here, here's my point, which I'm just coming to now. I'm doing a very healthy behavior for myself, and it's going to be probably a year of being with my shame about mm -hmm. doing a, a super healthy process for myself, right? Wow. Yes. So, yeah. So, it blows so, my mind that when we're setting a boundary, we feel so mean, even when we're yeah. doing it with love and doing it even just, you know, respectfully yeah. it's yeah. it blows my mind how we how hard we are on ourselves oh. especially i think when we're really sensitive in general and we are you know in this field doing this work we know we've we've usually you know every therapist or coach i've ever worked with has dealt with a tremendous amount of pain themselves yeah. and they never want to inflict that on anybody else mm -hmm. and so it's like we we almost like because i do the same it's like I assume that that person is going to, you know, they would feel the same way that I would feel if that were to have happened to me. Yeah. Some people respond that way, but you know, some people don't, Yeah. you know, thank yeah, you for yeah. sharing that. I mean, I think that's a really powerful example of standing for yourself. It's been very interesting and I, and I'm going to keep doing it. You know, I, I, I've had so much forgiveness for the other person. Mm. Uh, that I was actually thinking maybe I'll change the rule a little, but I'm not going to go back and open up to this person and allow him back into my life until I have uh, uh, way more peace with my own shame issues. Mm. So it's actually ironically something that I'm not going to do today, but one day in the future, uh, I will probably, I'll probably thank him. Mm -hmm. uh, I, maybe, I, I don't know. If, yeah. he, he probably wouldn't get it exactly. Maybe, maybe he would, but um, it's, it's a hell of a lesson. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so I want to describe, I actually have a couple notes here on sure. the group. Now you're, you're in the group, yeah. you're in the relationship mastery group. 
And you've, you've looked around, I think. You've looked at some of the comments, right? Some of the comments, I've seen a couple of the, the video, some of these Zoom sessions that you've done. I've watched a few of them. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's a single uh, uh, struggle that is, 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 has happened so often in, in the comments hmm. that I almost now get that it's, it's like a universal struggle and, uh, you know, I coach men individually, so I know, you know, all the, if I ran a men's group like this, I know all the comments would be different. Mm -hmm. this, this is universally just about, you know, it's, you know a, a woman's struggle. And it's how to move at a pace to where they can detect the, the, the level of responsibility a man is going to take to actually be in a committed relationship, to, mm. to actually join them in a real way. And, you know, there's everything from the obvious signs of, you know, when a man, you know, meet, you know, meets you on a dating site and, you know, contacts you, you know, Friday at 5 p.m. to come by at 9. That's a pretty obvious one. But what happens with the more subtle ones is the women are saying, this is a behavior the men are doing. It doesn't feel good. Here's what he's saying. And while I help them suss that out pretty quickly, the, the, the one area that is so common is that the, 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 these, are, these are women that have known the guy for two, three weeks. In their communication to him, they're criticizing him. Mm, yeah, yeah. Now the men are doing other really stupid things, which are are, are just. They're, I almost laugh when I say stupid. They're just they're just obviously kind of like, you know, goofy, shallow things. But 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 men in some ways are very direct in in how much they mess up in these early dating things. The the women though are having these subtle little responses which criticize the men got it and what is so fascinating to me and, and, and I did some work earlier today actually coaching one woman on this it, that's that's how she's always approached it this this frustration towards men is built in before they even met the guy mm, absolutely and yes. I uh, I sometimes don't know exactly where to go with that because it's way early in their life. And, mm. and so, so if what I'm saying is resonating, um, you know, is this, yeah. are women coming to you with this kind of thing? Like they're, they're already frustrated with the man on date number zero. Right? Um, yes. <laughs> and from both sides, you know, a lot of the men I work with are, a lot of the men I work with have a lot of perfectionistic ideals of what they want their woman to be. So they can also be subtly criticizing in that way. But, yeah. you know, and I know you talk about this a lot and, you know, the work that I've seen um, you do is it's so much of that to me is, you know, I'm, I have no shame about sharing how emotionally sensitive I am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And from the beginning of my relationship, this particular relationship, I got to the point where I was really fed up with trying to pretend I wasn't. I was just <laughs> exhausted. Yeah. And my critical ways and my own, you know, ways of blurting things out in very unskillful ways started to come out, I think maybe after three or four weeks. <laughs> but as soon as I noticed that, like I, I put myself um, in therapy and I'm like, something is here. And if I continue this pattern of criticizing, it's not even so much I'm going to lose the person because I could live with that, but I'm like, I'm losing respect for myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? So what I often, you know, what I coach women on is the hardest part of relationships is owning our limitations, mm. owning them mm -hmm. and recognizing them and owning them. And that's why I do love the, the four horsemen, the Gottman yeah. work. Cause I recommend everybody read that book, even yeah. though I know you're not a big fan of, you know, the rec book recommendations, but I, I, do. I love Gottman. Yeah. It's amazing. And the reason I say that <laughs> is because 
I'm able to identify that I'm critical. That is my go-to when I'm upset. Yeah. And so I say, don't try to control that. It's already out. You've already done it. But it's actually been proven that the most important thing is how quickly we can repair. So if you notice yourself coming from that frustration, if you notice yourself doing or saying something that's out of your own, you know, if you know, you're out of whack with yourself and you're not really getting to the root, the shame I think kicks in to go back and own it. Yeah. You know, to go to that person, like, you know, I noticed that I was, I didn't know how to express it in the way that I wanted to. I'm desperately trying to connect with you and I do not know how. Or, and yeah. I honestly, I feel like people are so hungry for that level of um, ownership that if the person isn't right for you and they're not going to, not every person is going to be able to meet your emotional depth. Yes, they're not. I've dated so much. And I remember, I think I cried a month and a half in for something that had nothing to do with a guy, but he was so freaked out by my emotions yeah. that we, we couldn't make it work. But there's some, I think the work is more in owning, owning your sensitivities and owning your frustrations and all those things that are there and yeah. then not being afraid to go back and heal them because yeah, he might suck at some stuff on the other end of that spectrum and you modeling that piece and it coming from that confident, like, yeah, I'm insecure about this and I'm confident about it. Mm -hmm. I own it. Like I am so aware and I'm so sorry that I, that I led with that and I hurt you, you know, caring about that, that person, even if it doesn't go anywhere three months from now, because I think in the beginning stages, we don't even really allow ourselves to care about someone as a human being. We're looking at this, like, where's the result? Where is this going? Like, is this going to be yeah. my future husband? Is he going to yeah. pay for my dates? And yeah. really caring about the man, you know, like, thank you for taking me out on this date. And um, I'm uncomfortable with this, this stage and I don't know where things are going, but yeah. I want to know that I can, we can talk about that, you know, yeah. does yeah. that, does that yeah. kind of hit something? Yeah. Yeah. It's making me think how much, uh, when, when I have, uh, I've, I've got, I've had some couples and, uh, I'm working individually, uh, with a couple people that are just newly dating somebody right now. And I'm dealing with a lot of things that are, have been so intense. I'm calling them betrayals. Mm. And it's, and it's, it's, it's not a, an affair, but it, it, it's some big betrayals have happened in these, in the, with these clients. And, you know, the, the number one thing that I, I swear it, it, some couples or in, and individuals have to see me like seven or eight times till they can hear mm. what I'm about to say. You have to learn how to say, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Mm. Yes. I, I have no idea what to do next. I, I, I'm confused. It, it's, it blows my mind that just not having the ability to do that is what will then lead to a nine hour fight. And can I speak to that? Yeah, what you just yeah. said is so powerful, Derek, because yeah. if I have any trauma in my body or if I've experienced a really horrible breakup that I haven't really dealt with, I've kind of just, you know, gone to another relationship. Mm -hmm. When I say, I don't know um, what to do or I'm confused. Yeah. And again, if I'm particularly speaking, if there's more trauma, that yeah. is going to bring up such an overwhelming feeling of helplessness that it is utterly terrifying to yeah. feel. Yeah. Oh, like I'm telling you from personal experience, like saying the words, I don't know, is probably yeah. the hardest thing for me. Yeah. Like even going on this call, I was like, I, you know, I was like, what if I don't know what to say? <laughs> or, you know, I felt that I was like, how can I prepare? You know what I mean? It's <laughs> such a universal fear. Yeah. 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 It says a lot about your ability to trust the other person mm. too, doesn't it? Totally. To say, to say, I don't know. Um, and how they respond to that. Yeah, yeah. Now let me add one word to this uh, for the women. Uh, so the women, if they can learn to say, I'm a little confused, I don't know what to do. And then they say, help. Mm. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, th th this, this is an area that comes up so much in my work. Mm. Help, I need your help, right? You know, so, so let's say a woman has a very complex set of emotions. Um, the, the, I, I don't want to say women hurt more than men 
but the way their emotions are spread out is more complex. Definitely. There, there's just, they might have the same amount of feeling, but it's in 27 subparts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Totally. <laughs> so, so when, when a woman's going through all of that very complex set of emotions, you know, I, you know, I want, I want to kind of sum it all up and bring it all back together and have her be able to say to the man, uh, you know, I, I'm in tons of confusing emotions. Help. Um, can you just be with me? And, and you know, oh, it's, it's a woman's responsibility. If she wants to take it on mm -hmm. to teach a man a little bit about him not having to fix it. Absolutely. If they come to couples counseling, which, you know, like, I don't know, maybe 1% or less of couples actually come to couples counseling, um, you know, they can learn it there. But it is a huge thing because the male mind at all times is trying to find equilibrium more for the, for, well, it's for himself ultimately, but he's trying to figure out how to help the woman calm down and open her bright eyes and look at him with responsiveness. Mm -hmm. We are always, always trying to figure that out, no matter how big the mess no matter how resentful we are, no matter how much we think we need, you know, no, ma no matter how much we need to be heard, when a woman's talking, we want to figure out how to help her feel good, and that erases all of our resentment in an instant if it's done well. It's, 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 it's bizarre how different this is from women. Women are not at all times just trying to figure out how to make the man feel good. Mm. that's one thing out of an array of things. Now I'm not, you know, I, I I'm making this up as I go, yeah. but, but uh, I've been witnessing that for a long, long time. So, so the male might, you know, so if you ask us for help, that just snaps us out of going in circles and having to figure out how to help. Mm. And that makes it, us believe, wow, you want my help. Then I have esteem. I feel like I'm valuable and that I have a job to do, and there's a possibility that I might have affection with you tonight. Totally. Right, and that is that, I mean, what I'm describing right now is uh, the, the, the core of a couple in distress in terms of what she could learn to do to help the man get out of almost any scenario. There isn't an exact opposite that I have for what men can do for, to help for the, the woman. woman get out. Yeah. It's more complex. Yeah. So, it's so anything I've said that strikes you as too, uh, too simple? Sadly, no, <laughs> not too simple. I mean, when you talk about the masculine energy wanting freedom, so it's like everything is a, becomes a problem to solve and he wants things to be, like you said, go to that nothingness, you know, yeah. that equilibrium. Yeah. And whereas a woman, you know, wants her, wants her feelings to be expressed and wants to show them, but that, you know, learning how to do that in a way, I love help. I mean, help has been something that I practice and has been a life changing skill. And again, it's like, if we have shame, you know, it's like really putting down our pride to be able to look at our partner as a partner, not as our adversary, not yeah. as somebody that we're, you know, we're battling it out with. They want to be on our side. They want to help us, but it's, it's like, if we've grown up in conflict, if we've never really seen that model, somebody modeled that just uttering those words is like opens up a Pandora's box. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You, you've seen probably some of the stuff I've written about, about vulnerability Yeah. and vulnerability, like is what we're describing right now. Uh, uh, saying, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm confused. I'm hurting help. Yeah. That's total vulnerability. And what I, something I want to say about vulnerability, which is uh, something I'm, I don't want to say I'm frustrated or sad. I just want to say this, this, is, this is maybe sometimes what keeps me up at night. Let's, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. Okay. So I, I've read, I used to uh, recommend Brene Brown's books on, uh, on vulnerability before I knew how much I was going to make it the center of how I, help couples reattach and the the books are good and at the end people would go out and get you know three books 900 pages 
and come back and say, well, what the hell do I do? Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, I went through the books and I mean, you could go open up any one of those books, read a paragraph and try to apply it. And it's, you know, it's, 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 it's tricky. What do I do? So the, the beginning stage, I'm, I'm actually kind of just saying this to the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. The very beginning is we all need to know that a good coaching program for vulnerability, I've never seen one yet. Mm. And it's the key of how to interrupt every argument. And I don't know what I'm going to do about that yet, but I am going to say it's almost like if none of us knew exercise was good for our health and there weren't exercise programs yet, and we were in denial about even needing exercise. Mm. that's what I'm going to say uh, is where we're at with vulnerability. Vulnerability usually happens between people by accident. Totally. When deeply meaningful things happen, like the loss of somebody who dies or a funeral or a breakup, that's when people recognize the, the real meaning of what somebody meant to them. And that happens at the end of relationships beautifully, Right. Yeah. There's a part of a breakup that's beautiful, but it's during the relationship that the, you know, theoretical 10 to 20% of super happy couples, I don't know what the percentage is. Mm -hmm. I actually don't want to quote what John Gottman thinks the percentage is. Yeah. Of couples. <laughs> it's going to, it's going to make it, you know, I'll cry. You know, when I rewatch this video, it's pretty low. Yeah. And those are couples that know how to do the reach outs. What does he call it? He calls it uh, the bids. For the bids. Yeah, the bids. Mm -hmm. And couples that know how to do that are vulnerable all the time. And that's what keeps. So, so um, you think I'm onto something with how new vulnerability is as a thing that's practiced and even known as, as necessary? <clears throat> I do in the sense of there's a lot of superficial vulnerability in the, in the culture that I have seen, you know, in a lot of the social media, there's a, there's, let me just be transparent and dump everything. I'm being vulnerable. Yeah. Let me just tell you my whole life story on the second day. I'm being vulnerable. Yeah. And yeah. it makes me, you know, it, it was, it's, it's, there's a vulnerability that's self-focused and there's a vulnerability that's relationship focused. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, that's the piece that is, needs to be taught that, um, how can I be vulnerable in a way that brings you closer to me rather than let me just make it all about myself? Yeah. And yeah. that's not, that's again, it's like a, it's a teaching skill because if yeah. you haven't had the experience of someone being that way with you, we need a class for it. We need a therapy. We need to, we need to do something with someone. So we maybe accidentally say something vulnerable to our therapist in a moment without thinking about it. Yeah. And then the therapist can mirror back, wow, you were being really vulnerable there. I felt closer to you now. Yeah. So a lot of my work with individuals is all about the relationship with them. So we do a lot of, um, I do something that's, we do notes to each other after our sessions. Mm -hmm. And I don't do this with everyone. I don't do this if there's a lot of trauma, but so for example, we set all these things during the session and we leave. But after we leave, we have all these insights and things that come up. And yeah. what I do is I, I send them a note, a couple of paragraphs, which um, the brilliant Irvin Yalom created this in his, yeah. own, in his own work. And yeah. it allows me to model that vulnerability. Like during our session, I felt nervous when you shared this, or I felt really close to you when you shared this. And I, I'm the one who reaches out and bridges that piece and models that. And even though it's uncomfortable, but that is, it's almost like we have to be breathing in that vulnerability consistently in order for us to really take it into our bodies. And so every session has to be infused with that. And then they write a response. And so they write, you know, what they felt. Okay, well, I felt like I didn't share as much as I really wanted to, but I wish I did. Or, you know, after we got off, I realized that I was more angry with you and I wanted to share that, but I'm scared because I respect you. Yeah. So those are the, it's almost like the vulnerability gets to happen after the session, Yeah, which is, has been profound in yeah. our work. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, and it, 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 I think it was interesting what, what you said about, you know, I'm going to dump everything out and I'm going to say it all and I'm going to be vulnerable. The, yeah. the one thing that's so unique about vulnerability is it, it, it can't be faked. Mm. 
Yes. If there's a bunch of strangers in the room witnessing two people having a conversation, almost everybody in the room knows this vulnerability happened. Mm. It's, it's, Isn't it's that amazing. A, it's a like sixth sense type of thing that people feel. And I'll take that example of the, the dump where you meet someone new that you're dating and you spill everything and you think you're being vulnerable. Yes. You could talk for an hour and tell them about your childhood this and your childhood that and all your bad relationships. Um, or what blows my mind about vulnerability constantly is how uh, short it actually is. Uh, it, nobody can be vulnerable for more than 15 seconds or 30 mm. seconds or, or so you're sitting there on a third date and you know, here I'm going to say something right now. That's uh, uh, I'm not being vulnerable right now. I'm going to say something that would be vulnerable though, mm -hmm. which would be, you know, um, I'm finding that I want to just blurt out all this stuff about myself as a way to try to uh, get you to like me. And I think I have to do that. And, and I'm, and I'm kind of holding back and it's a little confusing. Uh, uh, and I'm, and, and I'm not sure how much to say. So that made me a little nervous to tell you that just now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's what I want people to be able to do. Mm. Um, and that comes from my, uh, uh, I've never said what I just said. I've never actually said that personally, but the reason I believe in this work so powerfully is because, uh, I, I changed my life with it entirely. And I don't have dysfunctional friendships or any kind of relationships in my life anymore. And that's because I interrupted all of the arguments that I've had with everybody with vulnerability mm. and witnessed that some stayed and mm. some left. And I don't have resentments or regret about any of it. That's, I, I can't say I feel completely centered on every aspect of my life, but that's pretty darn clear. Mm. So that's, that's why the, so my personal life is why the focus switched from, for example, learning Sue Johnson's series of steps on how to get a couple to reattach versus the fact that I don't need to do her steps one, two, and three, because I help couples feel safe in the first 30 minutes, yeah. usually the first five minutes. I don't need to have a period of three to four sessions to make sure they're safe, Right. So I move right into attachment sometimes 10 minutes after I've met them. And it, it's all about the fact that when, you know, like John Gottman would say, when you look out the window and mm. you see the bird flying and you say, wow, look at that bird. Tell me about the birdie. Tell me about the bird, right? Does yes. the other partner turn and look out the window, even ask you about the bird, care about the bird, care that you have anything to share, mm. right? Yeah. And, you know, I used to have my dog in here on the first session with every couple. And the dog would tell me everything. Not, I, I didn't care necessarily if people were a dog person or not. But one person's petting the dog and the other couldn't care less that the other person's having joy. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so. I like the dog. I can, I can totally yeah. understand how just witnessing that can be like a snapshot into what other things are happening all yeah. throughout the relationship. Yeah. 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 And I think, I think while people probably feel very comfortable right from the beginning with you is because you have an, you have, you have an ownership of your own vulnerability. You know, like I was saying, owning our limitations, yours is like an owner. Everyone has like their, their, their strength in something. And it's like your comfort with your discomfort yeah. makes other people makes you know, makes me feel more comfortable to be uncomfortable. And so oh, you know, yeah. it's huge. It's, it's extremely yeah. important for, I think, therapists to, because, you know, even if like, let's say a client were to come to me and tell me they're upset with me about something and I can't apologize or I can't be uncomfortable in that moment. Right. Whereas a lot right. of, a lot of times, you know, I've worked with coaches where it's reverted back. And so you get to really see um, through the relationship you can just, you can do, like you said, it's a sixth sense. You know, if it's happening and you know, when it's not happening and you know yourself, you can't even fool yourself, but you, we've been, we've mastered just living in that state for so long. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 one, once I started practicing, you know, kind of saying the truth more about all these friendships I had that just really weren't working too well for me when I really said the truth about that more. And then 
I brought it into the, into the room here with clients, uh, I started recognizing that like my body is a tuning fork mm. for what they're probably going through. If I'm sitting there and one person is talking and I'm like, you know, I'm like falling asleep. I'm like, I'm like bored out of my mind. I, I, as counselor, I used to, uh, uh, judge myself as that's not cool. Mm. But that actually tells me if like, if the man's boring, mm. that actually tells me his wife's going bananas, yeah. right? She's bored out of her mind probably. Mm. So trusting that tuning fork, uh, is, is, has been really helpful. So, totally. Like being, yeah. being able to mirror back to the, you know, to the person, um, you're telling me a lot of content. You're telling me all these things, but I still don't feel connected to you yet. Yeah. You know, and that's not hard. That's not easy to say, but I think when, you know, when I have the agreement with the client, you know, I'm going to tell you these things and it's, you know, to help you with outside your outside relationship. When we get that agreement, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's life changing. I mean, what's possible on the other side. And you, like you said, we will lose relationships that don't meet us in that place. Mm -hmm. you know and i think if we've been living there it's 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 like one partner will go there first and the other partner gets to choose am i going to meet them or not yeah and that's the scary that's that's the thing i think we're always thinking in the back of our minds you know yeah oh, if i go there they may not go there yeah yeah Kel kelly has a, a question on here and she right. said uh, um how can you say help and then not expect a man to fix it it seems contradictory. <laughs> you want to try? Sure. Um, oh, because we're going under the premise that we don't want to have expectations. Is that what we're... Well, if I was saying how women can say, you know, a good thing for them to say is help. Mm -hmm. And then if you're saying help, uh, but then I was also talking about a man not fixing it. I actually meant a Got few it. things about him not fixing her feelings. Got but it. there's a contradiction there. So she, if she says help, what is she asking for help about? And it might be to fix it. So I'm going to stop yeah, answering. Yeah. I, keep, I keep answering. So what, do you, what do you think? Um, well, I think it's an, it's an amazing question, first of all. Um, I think that we wait to see the response, to see his response, you know? How kind is he? How loving is he? How responsive is he? Does he show... Even if he if he's confused and flustered a little bit, but yeah. does he turn like you said the bids? Those are bids, and they're happening in the beginning of relationships as as much as long term relationships. Mm -hmm. Does he care that you're hurting, especially if you're saying help? Because I know for me, if I just feel the energy of my partner caring for me, if I'm hurting, that's mm -hmm. all I need. Mm -hmm. That is the fixing. It's the yeah. caring. I don't need you to go buy me a a burp, a purse, or you know. So it's. Yeah. But if somebody tends to get defensive or, um, you know, starts to stonewall and shut us out, then, and they're not aware that they're doing that. It's one thing if they get defensive right away, like, uh oh, I don't know how to help you. But then they catch themselves. Yeah. Shit, I just realized I got really defensive. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That is the most important skill to look for in a partner. I like for me, it's like in myself, it's like I, I wish I could like have like a written like a Bible on my body for me to own when I get in my own way and to be with somebody that's willing to do the same. So yeah. that requires us to model that for a while first. You know, I got to be modeling that for uh, maybe a month, however long I'm willing to invest in this person. Are they showing growth? Are they engaging a little bit more each time? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if we are with somebody that's more avoidant or more anxious, they come with a specific nervous system that's built that way for many, many years, and we can't expect them to just automatically show up. But there has to be some level of awareness in order to meet each other. Otherwise, it's just really, really challenging, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to... Uh... I'm going to add one thing to it because um, it's, 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 it's kind of a new thought I'm having. It is such a good question. Kelly asked you, yeah. how can you say help uh, as a woman and then not expect a man to fix it? It seems contradictory. So, uh, boy, I'll tell you, if a woman can ask for help and give the man a tiny bit more direction on the kind of help, 
Mm. Uh, that would be really, that'd be super useful. So if, it, uh, and I'm going to just make that two different possibilities. So a woman comes and says to a man, um, you know, my, my sister, you know, was really rude today, you know, and hung up on me, you know, and there's a little more to the story, let's say, and he knows it. So it would be really helpful if she could say, you know, could you help me? And the kind of help I need is give me ideas on what to say. I want you to actually fix it. I'd like ideas on what you think would be good. Or would you just listen to me and hear my frustration about this and, and, and you don't have to solve anything, you're off the hook. Would you just hear my frustration about it? I love that. Yeah. That's so helpful. Yeah. From both sides. Yeah. From both sides, you know, especially when I think a lot of women want to direct their men and really guide them with certain things, which I know can be very triggering. Mm -hmm. And just asking, you know, asking permission, creating that container first is so helpful. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be amazing if a woman can do that. And, and it's equally amazing, actually maybe even more amazing, if a man knows what that means. Mm. That's very tricky if a man hasn't done, you know, a couple of years of, of therapy of some kind, like for a man to know what listening is mm -hmm. and not try to solve and get her to feel better so he can feel loved mm -hmm. for him to actually know what that means to be off the hook, to not have to solve the problem like technically, but listening is what helps her, uh, open up entirely to him. That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting thing because he has, to, he has to deal with frustration, maybe even shame inside, because that's how men are socialized. We fix it. And the only way we're gonna be loved is by doing, 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 solving the dilemmas of others. So for him to be told, you don't have to do any of that, just listen and hear me and nod your head uh, and, and with, you know, being real and listening. Anyway. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And you, you, you speak about this part too. And, um, and you know, one thing that's been really helpful for me and suggesting to clients is also, I'd love your help, but I don't want you to feel pressured. You know, that yeah. pressure piece is, is yeah. so, because, you know, we do like, we clam up when we don't know, because what if I don't know how to help you? And like you said, I, it might make me even feel more shame, you know? So, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, we can go on and on about the different <laughs> levels of vulnerability that's happening on both sides, but it's so amazing what starts to happen is like, it's not even about the conversation anymore. It's about what's underneath, like what vulnerability comes out as a result of the thing we think we're fighting about, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. creates the connection. That is what makes us feel, you know, safe with each other, that we're willing to expose help, I don't know how to help, how I feel defensive, I'm criticized, and it was like all these ways that, you know, we push each other away that we don't even realize. And yeah. I love that you said, you know, how important it is for, for men to do that therapy piece too, you know, for both men and women, but yeah. because I do notice men, you know, really, really get paralyzed around um, when they, when they, when their woman is upset, yeah. you know, when their woman is upset with them, they go into terror. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Yeah. I'm in trouble. She has a look on her face of something's wrong. I did it. I caused it. I'm in trouble. I need to come up with a solution. I usually don't come up with solutions that make her feel better. Feel better. I'm going to try again to do it the same way I've always done it. Yeah. What the hell's happening? I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty predictable and uh, pretty laughable and pretty uh, uh, awful. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all, yeah. all of the above. It's, uh, it, it, yeah. men have no idea when they come in here that they're, they need to learn how to not more, more, more than anything else, learn how to not do things, mm, learn how to so stop hard. doing things. So hard. Oh yeah. my gosh. When all that emotional energy is taking place and all this, like, how do you expect me to just sit here and like stillness and just listen, you know, yeah. it's such a, that's why meditation, you know, yeah. meditation or movement for women or, you know, for men, meditation for men and women. I mean, I, I encourage both men and women to do both, to have some practice that opens us and some practice that can kind of help us be a little bit more detached. Yeah. 
as a way to, you know, really build a tolerance for those uncomfortable feelings that yeah. need to come up. Otherwise, we're never going to regulate them. They're just going to stay locked in the body. Yeah. You know, we all need to feel our shame. Yeah. We need to feel the shame, Derek. Yes. <laughs> And in that scenario, women uh, need to learn how to uh, validate the man that he listened and mm. didn't fix it, and that was enough. Mm. She's so pissed off at, at the point when they're in here that she misses that component. Mm. So when he does that and he listens, you know, I'll ask her, you know, well, how was that for you? And she'll, mm. you know, she's crying and she's, oh, that was great. And then she'll move on to the next thing she's pissed about. Got it. That yes. has to be interrupted for her to actually give him this information. You listened. This is what you did. This is why. This is why I feel open to you now. So anyway, coaching. So how do people find you? Sylvie Chokassian. Sylvie Chokassian. Chokassian. Um, I would say the, the primary place would be my Instagram. It's at Sylvie Kukassian. I post, you know, daily on there. I do lots of live sessions and I offer lots of free, free support for couples and singles. And then um, through that, they can find my website and all that juicy stuff. Okay. And they can uh, email you through that? Yeah, there's a, my email is linked to it. It's info at sylviekukasian.com. And then um, Sylvie Kukasian is, there's no way anybody's going to, there's no way anybody's going to even remember that. So yeah. maybe, maybe it'd be helpful if it was written somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It will be. It's on this. Yeah, I'll make sure it's on okay. the post. I think it is already. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, thanks for geeking out with me. Oh, it was such a pleasure, I think we did the geeky uh, counseling thing here. We did. It's an honor. And I'm so, I'm so grateful that you reached out and I look forward to doing many more with you. Yes, me too. All right. Have you out again. Thanks, Sylvie. Thank you so much. Thank Bye, you. Derek. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Mm -hmm.